lines of data onto one high speed line. That was multiplexing, a multiplexer and a demultiplexer on the other side. So what multiplexing basically means is, in this sense, is that means you want to monitor multiple input or output lines at the same time. That means you want to know if something happens on any of the incoming input lines or something happens to the, to the output lines so that we know what, what's happening. Right? If you remember previously, we, our, our, we, have, we have prepared a simple client data, we have prepared a simple client and server version. Right? So the, the server version will basically create a child process when the client connects and the client uh, will get an input from the user and then send the input to the server. The server will, will echo back the same line back to the client. Right. And we saw that there's a problem. So let's, let's look at the, the diagram again. So we have client, we have a server. The server will, crack, will, will create a listening port. The client will create a socket. Right? The client will get input from the user. So once the server connects, then the server will make a, a child process and socket will be here. So this will be connected to here. And then this will be connected back to here. And then back to the user. Right? This is what we were doing earlier. The echo server. So we will have a few commands here. We will use f get s so that the client will get an input line from the user. Then it will write to the socket, then it will go to the server. Server will basically read on the socket and then write back the same line. The client will read and then it will output the same thing. Right? This is what we were doing earlier for the uh, simple echo client server. The main thing was that, we, we saw that last time, so now the server is only waiting for the, it's only waiting for one, one connection coming from the client, so no problem. But the client is basically two things. One is waiting for the user to input something. The other thing is also waiting for the reply back from the client. Oh, sorry, back from the server. So this particular client has two input outputs. One from the user, Input one, uh, two inputs, one from the user and the other is coming from the server. So you need to monitor both. And remember, we saw that last time, if we kill the child process, the client wouldn't know because the client is busy waiting for the input from the user. So client wouldn't know that the, that the, server, that the, child, the server has gone down until it tries to send something and this because once, once the child process goes down, the socket is closed so you cannot write, then it gives you a abnormal termination error. So basically it means that now the client has multiple input outputs and you cannot monitor all of them at the same time. Right? So that's what we will do in the multiplexing. Handle, handle that kind of problem. Right? So when do we need multiplexing? So simple, when a client is handling multiple descriptors of sockets. So you have a standard input and a socket. Right, so it is a case of a client here. Client handling a socket as well as handling the standard input. Right? When a client hand handles multiple sockets, so in this case it's just in one socket, but there could be multiple sockets. Server is handling both the listening and the connected sockets. Right? So the server handling listening, it has listening socket here, it also has a connected socket here. 
So new new client coming in, the server must still be running. It must be able to detect the incoming connection from the listening port and then invoke the child process. Right? So the server could be also be hand, uh, handling multiple inputs. Or server could be handling both UTP and UTP sockets or UDP sockets. In this case, we are currently using all TCP. Right? So in, later we will see that we can also create UDP sockets to handle UDP data traffic or TCP data, tra data, tra data traffic. Right? So each one have a different type of socket. So then we have multiple sockets. Or again, server could be handling multiple services or protocols. Right? So all to do all these things, there are five different models. Uh, input output multiplexing models to handle this multiplexing. Right? This is what we're going to look at today. So the first one, the blocking I/O. It's very so. Before we go into that, we, let's see there are two parts here. When we say, for example, the client, right, he wants to read data from the from the socket. What he does, he, he sends a command. He writes a command, read, and then he waits until the data is has been given to the client. So there are two, two actions here. First is that the data must be sent by someone to the socket. Right? So data must travel to the socket. Data must arrive at the socket. Second action is once the data arrives at the socket, then you, you actually will read from the socket into your buffer. So there are two actions. First is to wait for the, doc for the data to arrive. Second is to read from the socket into your buffer. So these are the two actions. So the application will make a function called to read the contents from the socket. But in the kernel, in the OS, at the TCP layer, there are two actions basically, waiting for data in the socket. Once the data arrives in the socket, then data gets ready. Then only it will copy from the socket into your buffer, into the user buffer, before you can actually view it or display it or whatever it is. So the blocking I.O. is basically that the function you use, it waits, it blocks. It blocks until the whole process is complete. And just like this read, I say, on the client side, I say, I want to read the data. After I send the data, I, I call the function read, and my, my, my program will basically block here. It will block here until I get the data. I can, the data is put into my own buffer. And I cannot do it. Cannot do anything else. So the client cannot be cannot be doing anything else. Right? So this, this is what we call blocking. So here they call here they use a function called receive from is the same as read, right? the one we use here. So once the receive from or read function is applied, then email system call. It will wait until so two two parts here. Wait for data gram to be ready. That means there is data arriving in the socket. Once it arrives, that will be copied from the socket buffer into the user buffer. Only then the results will be returned to the calling program. Then only it will be go ahead. Right? So, so in the meantime, the program cannot proceed, cannot do anything else. Right? That's why it's blocking. So that means what happens is that you're basically waiting for data to come. Right? The second option is that the trouble, the trouble with the first option is that we do not know how long we need, we need to wait. You call a, a read function, you, don't, you do not know how long it will take. Right? And there's no indicator. You will only get a final indicator once the data is copied into your, buff into your buffer. The second type is that, so the non-blocking means that we try not to block our program. We want to make a call and then we do not want to get stuck there. Right? So what we do is we make a call, receive from, in this case, if you're using a, if the TCP is using a non-blocking I/O, then it will immediately reply. You make a call, say read or receive from, then the, the OS or the or the TCP will basically reply. Says I have no data yet. Send you error back. No data. Then the program will ask again, got data or not? Say no data. Got data or not? No data. Until keep asking repeatedly. Until the TCP says, okay, I have data now. So once, that means now there is the data has been received on the socket. So now it will, after that it will copy 
the data from the socket into your buffer. Right? So initially, here that means once you get, once you get, uh, you make a call and then the the kernel it replies that there's no data. You can go and do something else if you want to. While waiting for the data to arrive, you're not you're not stuck there. That is what that is what is mean by blocking. Right? A typical example would be, for example, you are you have you have received uh, information from your friend or from your parents says, okay, go to go to Glugor uh, post office and collect a, collect a parcel. Parcel, we are sending you a parcel. Right, so you receive an SMS. Okay, you go to the you go to the post office. If you're using if you're using the blocking mode, the moment you receive the SMS, you go to the post office and wait there. And you wait there, you wait there, you wait there until the postman gives you your parcel. It might take you one hour, two hours, one day, two days. In the meantime, you are stuck there, right? Because the parcel has to arrive by the transport, and then it will be passed to you. If you are using non-blocking mode, then you go to the post office and ask them, is there any parcel for me? He said, no, okay, then you come back. Then you go ask again, got or not? He said, no, okay, then come back. So you check once a while. The moment you get, then you wait for a while, it will be given to you, all right? The third type is that we do different function. We don't earlier we have been calling the same function, right? The read. The third type is that we are going to use, we're going to differentiate. Differentiate, we use a different function for different parts. So we call a select function to wait for data. And then once the data is ready, then only we will read the data from the socket into your buffer. Right? So what this select function will do is that. This is a special function. Right? So select function will monitor the sockets or the input lines. Once the data is ready, it will inform you that, okay, now data is ready. So that now you, you can go ahead and call, you, you make, a, make a function call to read the particular socket data. Right? So the, the calls are basically, the pro, so the, the functions are different. Select function, once this is successful, means there is something, some data has already been copied, uh, has, has, some data has already arrived on the socket, only then you make a read from the socket so that you can actually get the data, can read the data to the buffer. Right? So there are two different functions. The fourth type, we use a little bit of signal processing, the one we saw last week. So what we do is that we establish a signal, right? a signal handler, and say that, all right, I'm going to read data from the socket and I create a signal it says that the signal will tell me if the data when the data arrives if it will inform me then I enable the signal and, and then I can continue doing something else right so we establish a signal handler right here and this signal will, will, will make a call to the kernel and the kernel will reply that okay I, I have receive your signal instructions. Once the data arrives, I will inform you. Right? So once the data arrives, it will deliver the, it will create a signal and send to the user. So in the meantime, user can do something else. Right? So you don't have to wait. Once data arrives, okay, now you make a call to read the data from the socket to your buffer. Right? So just like, again, post office example, you go to the post office and says, okay, I'm, someone has sent me a parcel. Can you please call me once the parcel arrives? Then you come back home. You wait for the call then. You do something else until the postman calls you and says, okay, your parcel has arrived. Please come and collect. Then you go, go there and collect. Right? So that's the signal. But you are, you are doing something else, but you're always alert. You're always alert for the uh, for the signal to be delivered, right? So you're doing something else, but uh, make, make sure your system is alert for the incoming signal from the uh, kernel. The final version is everything is automated. It's synchronous. In a, in, a, in a sense that there's no waiting at all. So what we do is that we will do a different function again. 
In this, in this way, we will make a, inform the system again, the kernel that, okay, I have, I have uh, want to read the data from the socket, and please deliver the data to me once it's ready. So in this case, you make a call and then it will return. Then the process can continue doing something else, and the kernel will will wait for the data to arrive, and then also will copy the data from the socket into the user buffer. Only then it will inform the user, say that your data is now ready. So in the meantime, the user can continue doing something else here. So it's completely automated. Right? So the user don't have to wait. User only initially indicate that okay, I'm, I want to copy, I want to read data from the socket. After that, continue to do something else, and the kernel will inform the user that now your data is, has been copied into your buffer. Please take it from there. So the two process is combined. Right? So going, going back to the post office example, in this case it will be, again you go inform the post, the post office, you go to the post office and say that, okay, I'm expecting a, a parcel from someone. Right? So the postman will say, okay, go back home. Once the parcel arrives, we will deliver it to your house. Everything is done. Right? So once the parcel arrives, you just go back home and do something else, the, the parcel will be delivered to your home. You don't even have to go and check there. Right, so this is the complete asynchronous version. So it's completely automated uh, version. Right? So these are different models we can use. Right? So meaning that this is different ways we can actually read the data or wait for the data to be arrived on the socket itself. So these are basically the comparison. So they basically again we mentioned earlier that two two phases, two stages. One is waiting for data to arrive on the socket. Second, you'll be copying the data from the socket into your buffer. Right, so you compare the differences. Right, so here from completely blocked, completely stuck, doing nothing else, but waiting for the data to completely independent and do, it, do something else until the data is delivered to your buffer itself. You can put into your buffer itself, right? If you, currently what we are using, currently what we have seen examples, for example, like, like all these are basically all blocking. Because when we say, we say uh, read here, we are blocking, we are waiting until the data is, has been sent by the server back to the client, and then it will copy from the socket into the buffer before we can actually read it. So this is basically a blocking mode. There's another way of looking at it. Synchronous versus asynchronous. So the five five modes. Synchronous basically means that the process blocks until the I/O operation is completed, right? All all together. So you cannot do anything else. That's what we've been doing so far. The asynchronous version is completely free. Right? It does not block for any I/O operation. Once I/O operation is completed, it will be informed. Right? So all these versions are basically different, this is synchronous, all of them are synchronous. Different parts are synchronous, a combination of both, this is completely asynchronous. Right? Because you don't wait at all. This is completely syn synchronous. Right? This is a bit of a mix. There's also a bit of a mix, also a bit of a mix. Right? Okay? So, so, coming back to our examples, so in, in socket programming, there are three functions to handle I/O multiplexing, right? The select, the p select, and the pole. Right? We're going to take a look at these three functions. Now remember what what we're trying to do. What we are trying to do is basically this: monitoring inputs, right? So the client has two inputs coming in, one from the user and one from the server. So we want to monitor both of them at the same time, right? For the server, there are two things, two sockets, listening and the connected socket, the client socket. So basically, new, in, new connections will be, will be handled here, existing connections will be handled by the child process. So basically, there are two sockets to handle here. On the server side, on the client side, there is basically the user and also the connection with the server. And this is what we're trying to do, what, what we will be handling.
Right, so let's take a look at, at the function or, or select function and see how it works. So what the select function does is that it allows the process to instruct the kernel to wait for any of the multiple events to occur. Right, so you, the select function will allow the user to inform the OS or the TCP layer what to wait for, right? what, what it should be waiting for. And then it will wake up once the process, once the one or more events has occurs or when it's time has, uh, has passed. Right, I, say, I say, okay, monitor these, two, these few things. If any of this has activity, let me know. Or I also give a time. If nothing happens within this time, let me know also. Right, that's a timeout. Right, so how are we going to call this? So select. So we say, okay, select, and then tell the kernel to return only when any of the, any of the descriptors in 1, 4, 5 are ready for reading. It means that I say socket number 1, socket number 4, and socket number 5. If they had, if it's ready for reading, there's data coming in. Please let me know. Any one of them, right? one or more, in socket one, four, and five, if that, there's data to be read, let me know. Or I can say, in sockets two and seven, if it's ready to output data, let me know. Output is ready to send data. Or I can say that right uh, for sockets one and four, if there's any errors happen in the socket, let me know. Right? So this is how we're going to do it. And we can also say, all right, I'm going to set maximum time limit or 10.2 seconds. And if something happened within 10.2 seconds, let me know. If nothing happens and time has expired, let me know also. Once the time is up and nothing happens, let me know so I can do something else after that. Right? So this is what the select function will actually allow the user to do. So this is what it looks like in the select function. So we have, first we have the maximum sockets we want to monitor, how many sockets we want to monitor. Right? So that's maximum FDP1, maximum number of descriptors we want to monitor. Right? We want to be tested. So always normally is maximum, maximum socket plus one. Then we have the read set means that these are the sockets, this is a set of sockets we want to read. These are the sockets, set of sockets we want to write. That means they are ready to be written, can send data. Read means the sockets has data coming in, it's ready to be read. And then this is the sockets, set of sockets which have some error happens. So this set me, the, what do you mean by set is basically this. We, uh, we, we, we indicate in a, in, a, in, a, in a set, saying these are the number of sockets which we want to monitor for reading, or for writing, or for errors. Right? So it's basically a list of sockets. And then we also have another parameter which is the timeout. Right? So timeout is how long to wait for specify descriptors to become ready. Right. So there are three possibilities. If, we, if I say the time is now, I didn't specify anything, that means wait forever. Until one of these, one of the read, write, or exceptional error, error sets has some data. Right? Just wait forever, or wait for a fixed amount of time. So you fix a number, if you put a value here, 10 seconds to 20 seconds, then you wait for that, that amount of time. Or if the timeout is equal to zero, that means we do not want to wait. Immediately let me know whether any of, of these sockets are ready to be read, to be returned, or has errors. Quickly go and check and let me know. No waiting. Right? So the time, for the timeout, there's also a structure. So timeout, you can specify in either seconds or microseconds. I see it depends how accurate you want to be. Okay. So related to the socket function, uh, related to the set function, there are also other supporting uh, functions. So FD0 is, 
is basically to clear all the bits in the set of sockets. And then this is to set. You want to set a particular socket within the set. Means that we want to monitor this socket inside the set. Right? We specify which one we want, which one we want to monitor. So that is setting. Zero means clear them all. And clear is basically clearing a particular socket within the set. Say earlier we want to monitor 145, right? So for example, like here. So before that, we will say, well, our set is the is a reading set. This this, this uh, set is for sockets to be read. First of all, we initialize all the values inside that to be zero, right? So it's zero here. Then we set socket one to the R set, socket four and socket five to the R set. That means we are going to monitor socket one, four, and five for in the R set for reading purposes. It means I monitor sockets one, four, and five for any incoming activity. That's what you're going to do. So turn on bit one, turn on bit four, turn on bit five. So, next thing is to see how many sockets can be monitored simultaneously. So there is a there is a so, there is a constant defined two two five six is the maximum set of the size maximum size of the FT set. So how many sockets we can monitor currently uh, at one time in the set is basically two five six. So that's more than enough. If you go back again here. The select function returns a value. Right? So what does, what does this value return? It gives you a count. How many sockets has data? Right? So we monitor the read, write, and error sets. We are going to monitor these sets, set of sockets, and what the return value will say that how many of them has is ready, has some data inside that. Right? So it could be one from here, two from here, three from here, whatever. That will be the total is six. So it returns a positive count of ready descriptors. And it returns you to zero and if it's timeout or negative one on error. Right? If timeout, that means time expired, none of them is ready, then it will give you a value of zero. Right? So this is a summary. So when when data when there is data to be read in a socket, then the socket becomes readable, right? The R set is readable, or can also be saying the other side is trying to half half close, or new connection coming in for listening socket. Again, this also it becomes socket is ready to be listening. For writable, that, that there is a there is enough space in the socket to send the data out, right? So then the socket is writable. Or we also can be, to say it, we, want to, we want to close one side, there's enough, enough uh, space in the socket to send the fin command. But normally what you're going to look at is first only this space available for writing and data available to be read. Right? The first condition is sufficient for our case. Is data coming in? Is that data already available in the socket? Then is the condition will be readable, right? The select will give you that. Okay, this particular socket has data inside that. Right? Pending error, right? If there's an error happening, then it will set both conditions, readable and writable, right? So error happens in the socket, is marked as both readable and writable. Then for exception handling errors, this only happens for special kind of, of, of errors whereby some, some urgent error has happened and it has to be informed quickly to the other side. So this, data, this error will bypass the queue and it will send very, very fast. So you want to check for this kind of urgent errors. So then we will check for this exception handling. Right? This is called TCP out of band data. Again, in our case, we will not be using this. Right? So for us, we need, only need to concentrate on this one, whether it's data available can be, re can be read from the socket or can be written to the socket. And that's good enough for us. So coming back to the string client function. Right, this, is, this is a client. So, so remember the client? 
The string client, what it does? It gets input from the user, it writes to the socket, and then it waits, and then it reads the reply from the, from the server, and then it will output to the uh, monitor to output. Right? So this is what a string client it does. Right? So what is monitoring is two things, right? The standard input and the socket. So standard input, again, so what we need to do is quickly check any of them has data at, at any time. So we're going to monitor both of these streams simultaneously by using select. Earlier, we couldn't do that, right? Because the moment we look at one, we write data, and then next we'll be waiting for the read. Once we're reading, waiting for the read to happen, we cannot see anything the user key. If you're waiting for the user to key in data, we cannot get we cannot read anything from the socket. So even though the server closed down, we won't know because we're not reading the socket at the same time while waiting for the user to key in something. And that was a problem earlier. So now we can do that. So from the standard input, from the user side, either you send data or send a file. That means that's the end. From the socket, few things. Once data coming in from the server, or data or the server close send a finish fin packet right, saying that you want to terminate connection or the server reply reset that means something has gone wrong the server has gone down and doesn't recognize the, the connection anymore right, so there are three possibilities here so this is what our string client looks like when you're using select so you should compare this with the string client version 01 so again, same things, what we need to do is that, right, we, so we, we will uh, create a read set. Uh, it's a type of structure descriptor set, right, R set. So first of, all, first of all, we we set the R set to zero. Initialize all the values inside there. Then we're going to set two descriptors in the read set. First one is the file number which is basically the user input. And then the socket, the socket here, the socket which has been connected to the server. Right? So we're going to monitor these two. So we set them, set these values in the R set. Right? Remember what we, what we mean by R set? When we set it, it means that that particular socket you want to monitor. Right? So we take whatever the descriptor number is for the user input, for the standard input, and the socket, and then we put them into the, and we say, set these two descriptors in the R set. That means we want to monitor them. Right? All right, after that, the maximum descriptors now is that max of these two plus one. Right? It's the easiest way to do that. And now we use the select function. Select function with a max, and then R set. You want to monitor this uh, set of descriptors for reading, and then for writing, we're not going to bother. For errors, no, we're not going to bother. And for timeout, again, no, no value. Very right, simple. We're only going to monitor. We're only going to use a select function to monitor the the two sockets. Right, the two streams. One is the user input, and the other is the socket connection. Now, once we do that, once you run the select function, the, so the select will wait here. So now the select is basically checking this, this coming in, and this coming in, right? So now the select will basically looking for these two things, right? Checking this one, coming in from the standard input, and then getting on this one. There's another function earlier we forgot to see. Uh, the is set. Is set is basically to check in the set 
whether a particular descriptor has been set. That means after you set it, then you run the select, and then you check whether a particular descriptor is set or not. It will be set if you've got data. Right? So that's why it does. So now after you, you select, then you wait. The program will wait until the select returns some value, returns the value. Remember the select will return the number of descriptors which have data. How many of them has data? So there are two, we are monitoring two here. So the value return could be zero, one, or two. Right? But since we are waiting indefinitely, no that timeout, we're going to wait until one of them has data. So the value written by select is either one or two. Right? So we're going to check. Is, is the socket descriptor or socket connection is set in the R set? That means the socket is readable. If it is, what are you going to do? Right? Second part is that if the file number, the one you set here, the user input. Is the user input has some data? So if the user ha input has some data, means that the user has keyed some data. Right? If the, the socket FD returns value, if we check here, this means that the server has sent the data to the client. And there's data available here. Right, so this is how we're going to check. So there's basically if statement. If statement for each, each uh, socket which we have earlier declared to be uh, monitored. So we monitor two sockets, two streams, and we check one by one, one, that, one, by one, each one, each one of them, and see, OK, is the, is the socket readable? If yes, what are we supposed to do? If the socket is readable, then we're supposed to read the content of a socket, and then we're supposed to output it to the screen. Right, so that's what we do. We read line from the socket, and then we put S to the standard output. That's what we're doing. Right, so the function remains, the, the basic job remains the same. So if the socket has some data, then we read the socket to the buffer, receive line, and then we output the, uh, the receive line to the standard output to the monitor for the user to see. Second one, we check for the user input from the standard in. Right? So again, we check if, if this descriptor is set in the R set. If it's set, yes, then what are we supposed to do? So the user has any data. That means we fcan s, read the data from the user, and then we will write it to the socket to be sent to the server. So we fcan s into a line, uh, fcan s from the socket, from, from, the, sorry, uh, from, the, from the stream, and then put into the send line, read it into here, and then write the send line to the socket. All right? So that's not much. The only thing we do to do is that we main thing is to worry about the select. After that, it goes back. Right? It goes back here. And then, again, set the same thing, same again, and then wait again. Monitor the two again. The moment any one of them has, a, has, a, has, a, has some activity, this or this, it will perform and then go back again. The thing, the thing is that it can, it can simultaneously check traffic coming in on both sides. That's why it is. Right? Not block on something and waiting for and forget about the other one. And because it's monitoring both at the same time. We, 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 term, we close the child process, we will send a fin command, right? a terminate connection. Since our client is monitoring both user input as well as the socket, the moment fin arrives, it will also check it. It will get it and it will know that it has closed, right? So that's, that's because we're monitoring both at the same time. Now earlier we do that, earlier we, remember the previous example, we do that, we use a wait command to check for the, we check for the child process which is terminating, right? We use a signal processing, that was a bit tedious. So here we're using select, we don't have to use the wait command to see any, which child process terminated. 
By selecting, by using select function, we are monitoring all the streams together. And the moment that there's data coming in, we could be, which could be a fin packet, which we can we can straight away get it, right? So it is very useful in that sense. All right. Now, so what we've been doing so far, our our client, our our our. Echo server and client, what it does that we are basically using stop and wait mode. Me means that the client will send a piece of line, a line from the user to the server and then wait for reply before send the next line. Right? So we, we send something to the server, wait for reply, only then can send the next line. This is what basically interactive features of stop, stop and wait, wait mode. So send one line, wait for reply. And then how long can you wait? It's basically the RTT, the round trip time taken between the client and server. So the further away your server is, it might take one, two sec one or two seconds. But in, this, in our case, it's very instant because it's on the same machine. Right? But the main thing is that you are sending data, for example, like here, time zero, the data goes over, reaches here, then the server replies. In the meantime, so, so there are two, com two, two channels, actually the sending and the receiving. While you're sending something, other parts of the, of the sending channel is basically empty. And while you're sending something, you cannot receive anything. Right? You have to wait for send complete, the reply comes back, then you need to send a new one. So most of the time, you see that the, the channels, the sending, the sending and receiving channels are basically not fully utilized. Right? So this is not inefficient use of the full duplex. Although the capability is there, but we are not fully using the maximum capacity of the, of the sending and receiving channels. So one way to do is that we use so-called batch mode or the full duplex mode. So what the client will do, the user will key in data and then keep, keep data, send, send multiple lines. Send multiple lines very, very fast. So these this lines will actually be be given to the user. If we keep, keep sending it, get a line, send to the user. Don't wait for reply. Just send first. Then a server will process and give you, give you reply. And the server will start sending you replies also continuously. Multiple, multiple replies at the same time. So if this happens a lot, then we are, we are fully utilizing the sending and receiving channels. Right, full duplex. Right, so in this case, we can use that. But the earlier version, we cannot do that because we are basically waiting. Right? We are waiting for, we, we send, the way we design our client server is that we, we send, we read a line, we send, we write, and then we, we wait for it, read here. We do not go back here and then say ask them to write, uh, ask the client to send something new. Now let's uh, take a slight uh, look at the difference between a close and shutdown. Now we've seen that a little bit earlier. We said that earlier when we, there's a close function, when you run a close function, it will check number of sockets open. Right? If the number of sockets open is more than zero, that means it will, not, it will, it will, it will decrement it, sorry. When you run the close function, it will see the number of sockets open and then reduce by one because you're trying to close the socket. After you decrement the, the socket count and check whether the new socket count is equal to zero. If that was the only socket available and you have closed it, then we will terminate the connection. Right? But if, if there are multiple sockets open and you try to close one socket, the remaining sockets will not be closed. Right? We will only decrement the counter, but we will not terminate the connection. That means we will not send the fin command. Right? That's what it says. So in order to, do, to overcome that, we can use shutdown. Shutdown basically means that it will try to close connection on one side only. Close means connection close both sides. You see, I, I, I'm connected to you, and I say close means that I don't want to send to you, I don't want to receive anything from you. And you are forced to close also. Right? 
Shutdown means that I'm only shutting down my side. I say I'm going to shut down my side. But you, are not, you, you don't have to follow me. You can continue. You can continue sending me. I shut down my side, then I have specified I'm shutting down for what? Shutting down for reading purposes, writing purposes, or both read and write. If I say shut down read, that means I'm not going to read the socket anymore. But I can send you data. I can still send, but I'm not going to read. If I say I'm going to shut down for writing, then I'm not going to send you any data. But if you send me something, I will still read. Right? Or I can say read write. So shut down read write is, is quite similar to close then. Because I'm closing both reading and writing. So if you say shut down on this side, means that the client will send a fin command, the server will acknowledge the fin. Right? But it does not send its own fin. So that means only the client is terminating connection. But server is no. Server I say I did not send you fin. You send me fin, I acknowledge yes. You want to close? Fine. I accept that, but I'm not going to close yet. Right? So I can still send you data. Right? Until I, the server sends fin. Okay, now I'm sending you fin. That means now I say I want to close my side of the connection now. Okay, so now the client side already closed the client side connection. Now the server sends fin, it closes the client side connection. Now both sides are, are, has been closed. So then the close becomes fully effective. Right? So shutdown is basically closing a terminate uh, or rather uh, closing connection on one side of the uh, socket only right? not both sides so again shutdown the function is quite simple we say which socket we want to shut down and then what is the action we want to shut down whether it is read write or both read and write right So here it gives you an example of the shutdown. Right? So here, string client using select and also shutdown. Right? So it just, it's, been, it's been the improved version of the, the earlier version. And it also checks for, it also checks for end of file. So it's slightly more, more, more detailed than the previous version. Right? So the main thing is the same thing. So we, we set the R set of the, uh, we set to the, R set is variable for the, this particular structure. So R set equals to zero, right? Then again, we're gonna set, uh, we're gonna set for the socket, we're gonna monitor the socket, we're also gonna monitor for the input, right? And earlier our, uh, this basically check for end of file. End of file from the user side, right? Standard input, end of file, that means whether the user has say he wants to stop, right? So initially it's zero, so okay. It will uh, check for the user input and also check for the socket activity. So we set these two on the R set and then we select right? on the R set and then this all three analysis. So now, again, same thing. Then we use the if set command, uh, if set function to check for the socket first. If it's true, that means the socket has some data available, right? So again, we're going to read from the socket and then we write to the, read from the socket and then output to the standard output. That's what we're doing. But at the same time, we check also whether enough file has been sent or, or connection has been terminated, right? So we check the read, read function. If n equals to zero, right? Then, then, it's, then we check end of file, whether end file has been true or not. If it's true, then we terminate. Otherwise, we say the client terminate uh, eventually. Same thing from the client side, from the standard input side. We check, we read the value, we read the standard input, see how many, how many bytes has been read, right? If the bytes read are equal to zero, that means now the user has is basically end of line. It's basically end of file. Right? There's no more no more data coming in from the user. So then we set the end of file flag to be one. And then that means user saying that no more nothing coming else, not nothing coming anymore from the user side. So user say okay, no more of this here. 
right. So, right. So once it gets read the user input, the standard input, n equals to zero, that means the user no no data to send anymore. So we set standard in the the end of file to be one. So what we're trying to do is that once we know that the user doesn't want to send any data anymore, then we next time select, we're not going to use monitor the standard input anymore. We're only going to monitor the socket. So that's what we're trying to do. All right, so we set this, and then we shut down the socket. We shut down for writing. All right, that means we shut down the rocket socket one side. We are not going to send anything, but we're going to continue receiving data from the server. And now we're going to clear the descriptor in our set. Clear the, the descriptor which is monitoring the standard input. And then we come here. So now the standard input is 1. So it will not set the file number anymore. And the select will only be using select will only be monitoring the socket for activity coming in from the server. Any leftover packets or data coming in from the server. So we have we have we have closed this, we're not going to monitor this anymore. We have shut down our socket for writing purposes. Our read is still open. So we just continue monitoring the socket for any new data coming in from the server. But we're not going to send it anymore. So that's how it works. Right? So the select now will only monitor the socket. It will not monitor the standard input. Right? So it allows the server to communicate with the client, but not vice versa. Right? So this particular version, it should be able to work in a batch mode. Right? So slightly more complicated, but more deep, more 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 comprehensive, right? Monitoring. Right. Okay. So that was on the client side, right? So we have we have seen how we can use select function to monitor. We, can, we, can, we have seen how the select function can be used to monitor the standard input and the socket on the client side. Now we're going to look at the server side, how we can use a select function, same select function, but to make it work on the server. So on the server, different things. Server basically you have one listening port, the listening socket, and also the connected socket to each client. So you have multiple clients, then we will have multiple sockets, connected sockets. Right? So now our server will have, always have one listening port, listening socket, but we'll have multiple connected sockets. So each one connected socket is for each client. So what we're going to do is monitor all this them, all of this based on the uh, by using select function. So to do this on the server side is we have to introduce a new data structure. Right, so this is what, it, what earlier is. So client connected on a socket, the server will have two sockets. Now one client connected to a socket, the server will, the server's listening socket will continue. And then what new new socket will be connect, will be created on the server to, to get it connected to the client. So what we're going to do is we're going to create two data structures. The client. What we're going to do here is we're going to keep the client socket IDs. Right? What is the socket ID for each client? Right? Client number one, client number two, so on. And then we have the R set, which will be used by select to monitor the sockets. So in this case, we will have, oops, sorry, right, okay. So initially we have a, a server with no clients yet. So only this listening socket is ready, is open. 
right? So then our, our client list is all empty, all negative one, negative one. We create a client, client uh, array to keep the client socket IDs. Because currently, they're all empty, all negative one, means there's no client connected to it. Then we have RSET. RSET is to basically to monitor the sockets on the, on the server. So currently, we only have one listening socket. So our listening socket will be normally FD3. Right? FD3, we set to one. Because that means out of these four sockets, we want to monitor this particular one, which is a listening socket. Right? So in this case, we assume that FD0, the first one, the first descriptor we reserve for standard input. The second descriptor we reserve for standard output. And then the error. Right, so in this case, we do not want to monitor the standard input because server side, we don't want to monitor the user. There's no user interaction with the server. Everything is coming through, through the socket from the client. Right? So standard input, standard output, we're not going to monitor them. We set it to zero. We're only going to monitor the listening port. So we set the listening port to one. Right? So when the first connection comes in, first client comes in, a new socket will be created on the server. So now, socket, new socket will be uh, a new, uh, so we keep, so the, the, the new, new connection, uh, new socket we, we want to monitor, right? So we set the FD4, we'll have a value one now. We want to monitor now two, we want to monitor two sockets, FD3 and FD4. FD3 is basically listening port and also the connected port. Right? So the other three, we ignore them. And then, and our first socket is ID4, right? So this four will go in here. Right? So our, our first client has a, has a socket number four, socket ID4. Right? That's why it says. And then when a second client comes in, Second client tries to connect to the server. The server will again create a new socket for the new client. What we'll do is that, right? Now your second client coming in, second client's socket ID will be kept in the second slot. And then, now we're gonna monitor one, two, and three sockets. So the new socket, new client socket will be, uh, we will monitor this particular socket also. And this is the Two client IDs, two clients uh, sockets which you want to, which you currently connected to it. So the max sockets we are connected to is now uh, we want to monitor is six. Right? Normally is the maximum uh, FD, which is normally five, right? Plus one is six. So we always use because the select uses one extra. Right? And if the first client now terminates. So the first client terminates, earlier it was four, so then we put back values negative one. That means this client is no longer, client zero is no longer uh, connected. So the client I, socket ID we remove, reset. And at the same time, we do not want to monitor the first client anymore. We only want to monitor the listening port and the socket of the second client, right? But our total maximum is still six because it's normally from beginning until the end. Right? So what we can do is that as the clients come and go, we, we by setting these particular values here, we can say in our set which sockets we want to monitor, which clients or which socket we want to, want to monitor. Right? So, so the client array, the client uh, array, right here, is basically integers of set size. So we go from zero, from zero until all of them, we set the values to negative one. Initialize all of them first. Right. And currently, the maximum socket, sockets we are, we are monitoring now is only one, which is the listening one. Right. And then we, okay, we zero all the all set. All set is the same as our set currently. Right. So initialize the R set, uh, all set uh, socket structure, socket uh, set. Then we set 
the socket set we want to monitor with the listening. So we will say that we're going to we're going to monitor the listening socket first, All right? Because we only have one socket open so far, which is the listening. So we're going to monitor this, All right? Okay, so that's our main for loop. And then, okay, this never mind, it will come like later. Now, we select. Use the select function. Again, MSF ready. We're going to use the R set. Right? R set is the same as all set, so we will fix it here. So currently, the R set says only monitor listening port. Right? That's what we have set earlier. Okay, now we check which port has been, has been, has some, has some value inside that. It's been set. So if the listening port is been set, what it means? It means that someone is trying to connect to the listening port. When someone is trying to connect to the listening port, it means that a new connection is coming in. Right? That's what it means. So a new client connection is coming in. Normally what happens if a new client connection comes in, we will try to accept the connection and create a new socket. Right? That's what we do last time if you compare this code. So what we do is that, right, so we will accept, run the set function and of the incoming client connection and then create a new socket for this particular client. And then what you're going to do, you're going to take this, the new client socket ID and put into the client array. Right, so we go again one by one, check which one is value negative one. Negative one, the first negative one, store the value inside here. Right, so if you go back to the structure, it will be doing like this. Right, coming in here. So client connection coming in. Uh, sorry, this the second one. One client connection coming in, right? You will create a socket, and then you will start from zero here, and then say, the first empty slot in the client array, we will put the connector socket ID inside here. That's what we will do. Right, so we save that. This is also you need to check if your once the array is full, you see too many clients, all right? And now we also are going to set the new socket connected. We add that to the R set or the all set. Means that now we have a new client connected to it. So we have new client connected to it. We set that client's ID position in the R set. So we're going to monitor the listening port as well as a newly connected socket from the client. Right? That's what we're doing here. Right, so set this here. Uh, we'll come to see this checking the maximum and all that. All right, and then so now our 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 select is monitor, going to monitor two things: listening port and the newly connected client connection. Right. So next time again, you go up here. Now the select will have. R set will have two, two values set inside there, listening port and the new client connection. So again, you will check, is any new client coming in? Okay, this time maybe no, right? If not set, then we come to here. Uh, we'll come to, right? So if not here, then we'll come to here. And if it's not, if not new connection, then we'll check which of the client is basically trying to connect, right? Has active, which socket connect activity has a, which socket ID has a, has a, has activity, which socket ID has activity. So check all clients one by one. So take the client from zero until here, put in your socket ID, and then check whether this socket ID is set or not. If it's set, that means there is data coming in from the 
server, oh, from the client, sorry. Right, so read the socket and then write the socket. It's the same thing. We're basically checking here. So first, we have multiple sockets, so we check which socket it is easy. Is this one set or this one set? If this one set, okay. We take the one, we try one modifier. This one set or not? If set, then read the value and then write back. After that, check the second one. Right? Go back to the loop. Check the next one. Next one set or not? I number two now. Get the next socket ID and set. Check whether it's set or not. Whether the second client has some activity. Right? So what is the, what what does the this server version does is that the select will monitor all of them. If it's a listen, it checks whether the, the whether the, the listen port listen socket is set. From the select, run the select. After that, check for listen, see whether listen is set, means that there's some activity here. If it is, then we're going to accept a new connection and create a new socket and then put it in the array. After that, we're going to check all the connector socket one by one. Take up from the client array and see whether this is with this activity. If it is, reply. Then check this one, go activity not, yes, reply, and so on, one by one. Check all client connections. Right? That's what you're doing. And again, of course, we're going to check if there's no, no data coming in from the read the socket, but the value is zero. That means the connection is already closed by the client. And then we do a shutdown. Right? We do a close on the socket. And then we're going to clear that particular socket from the, the, the socket uh, set. So the next time, we're not going to monitor that anymore. And that particular version, that particular client array value will be reset back to negative one. We clear the space. Right? So th this is what it all, all it does. So when you select when you when we select returns, it will give you a value of n ready. N ready could be zero, one, or two or three. Right? So if you guess it, let's say it's two, then after that it will reduce the value of decrement it and then if it's still more than more than more than one then go back and try the next socket until it becomes zero or less than zero then you break and then start again right so try to understand uh, how does it work the the, the select function on the uh, on, on the server side client is supposed to remove the socket ID from the from the client array and then also doesn't want to check the socket of that particular client anymore right so you're supposed to do this so in this case now what happens is that the, the same one server can handle multiple clients and we don't have a we don't have a problem of zombies anymore when a client terminates, fine, the server can handle it, and no no zombies remaining in the system, right? And the client and the server can both monitor all the clients at the same time, right? So this, but this particular client version we are running is old version, right? So now if I close my server. I close my server, my client doesn't know because it's the old client. Only when I type in something, we'll know, right? So now let's run again. This time we're running the new version of server which uses select and then the client version, we also run the select version. So server and, running, server and client both running the select version. Right? So now if I close my client, uh, sorry, close my server, that client will know. Right? So this handle handles very well. So if the server closes, the client will know. If the client closes, the server will automatically 
make appropriate adjustment. There's no child processes. There's no zombies, right? And uh, you can actually catch, or rather, you can take care of closing clients. Right? We don't need to create signals and all these things. So it's, it's much, much uh, better solution from the one we have earlier. Right? So the select is very, very useful in that sense because they monitor. So by using select, we not only the monitor multiple streams, but we can also also handle or listen to multiple, or rather monitor multiple sockets at the same time, in the multiple clients at the same time. So that was uh, select. And then there's another function, the second one, the p-select. So again, p-select is quite similar to select, not much difference. The only, the only thing is that if you look at the, the function declaration, we still have the maximum descriptors earlier, r set, write set, exceptional error set, still the same. We have the timeout, still the same. But we have an extra parameter is the signal mask. So here, the p-select actually supports signal blocking means that once the p-select is running, I do not want to be disturbed by any signals coming in from anywhere else. Right? So you can, you can set this particular parameter to say block all other signals coming in so that the select will only concentrate on the sockets. Right? For, for select, it cannot do that. For p-select, it can do that. And also the time, if you look at the the, time, the structure for the time, timeout, it has second and also nanoseconds now. Earlier, for, for select, it has until microseconds, microsecond resolution. For P select, it can go even more, it can give you even higher resolution until nanoseconds if you need it. Right? So normally we, will, we won't use uh, P select. The third function, the poll. Right? Again, the basic, the basic concept is still the same. We want to monitor multiple sockets at the same time. So the main difference is that by using poll, there is no, we can support huge number of descriptors. Earlier, select, we saw that there is an upper limit. Select allows you to monitor up to 256 different sockets at the same time. So if you have more than that, then poll will be a good solution for you. Right? So it's not so commonly implemented and it's, it's not very flexible compared to P-select. Right? So poll is normally seldom used. But anyway, we're going to take a quick look at the ex example given here how to use it. So poll, we have a, f uh, a descriptor array. So this is where we keep the sockets. sockets. And then we have a uh, number of uh, descriptors and then a timeout. So the, the, the structure is a bit different. And the return value from poll, again, it tells, it tells you how many descriptors are ready. Right? Or zero on timeout or one on error. This is still the same. The poll FD structure, it has which descriptor to check, which socket to check, and then what events to check for. And the R events is the return events. What are the action which actually actually happen? Right? So there are three things there. What to check, which, which socket to check, what so and what socket to check. And uh, the second one is uh, what events to check on that particular socket. And the third one is the results the return results of what actually happens on the socket. So this will become clear here. So the, the things, the action you can check is basically whether poll in, okay, forget about this one, whether there is poll, there is a normal data to be read. So poll read normal. That means you're using poll and the, the socket has, is ready to be, is ready to be read normal data. It has normal data ready to be read. Right? Of course, there are also check, you can check for priority band data, higher priority data, you can check different types of reading. Right? And then you can also have poll writing normal, 
whether the, whether the particular socket is ready to be ready for action, ready for writing action, a, a normal writing action. Right? So normally what we can do is only the pole read normal or pole write normal. And again, there will be also errors. Right? So what is this particular function will be given, uh, this particular uh, values or, or actions will be given in events and R events. So in events we specify, we want to check for this, we want to check for this, this, this and this. Then the poll function will return the results in the R events structure and say, okay, you ask for these two and these are the, all the four conditions which are available. Right? It basically gives you the results. And same thing for error. For error, you normally don't specify, and then it will just basically give you the, give you the, uh, the results. So the timeout for poll is sim similar things. We can put the infinite uh, constant, which means wait forever, or zero, return immediately, or more than zero for a specific number of time. Right. So let's again use the example. For the server, now this time the server we're using poll. So we create a, a client structure, right, for poll FD. Yeah. Create the socket structure, create the listening socket, fill up values, bind, listen. So this is how we use. So the first client we want to listen to is basically the listening port. So zero FD. FD, if you remember earlier, was the FD is which, which socket you want to listen to. Events, you want to specify what to listen for. So, we want to, we want to monitor listening spot, you put in the FD. And then, what events you want to look out for is poll read normal. Right? Say anybody who's trying to read, or rather, we, we have. Uh, reading activity on the listening port, the events, right? And then the others, the other client entries, we put negative one just to make it all uh, empty, right? So we specify this way. First, initially, we're only going to monitor the listening port. So we put listening ports socket ID into the first value, into the zero. And then we say, okay, we monitor for this particular activity, the poll read normal. After that, we can start making the, the call. We can make a call. Call the poll. This is the client structure, right? And then maximum number, and then we wait for forever until the poll returns and tells us how many sockets it has activity there, right? So now what we're going to check is poll and the clients are events, the return, the results. So if the client zero result events has is one, that means it is has activity, and the activity type is poll read normal. So now that means new client connection is coming in, right? So earlier here, now we're checking for the R result events. Earlier when we assign the value, when we assign the value, we put on the events. Right? So this is what we want to check for. R events is the result. What is the result of that particular operation? After new poll, we check R events and see whether the zero, the listening port, has some reading activity. If it is yes, then that means a new cl client connection is coming in. So we accept the normal seems as the select just now. So we accept, make a new co socket connection put this connection into the client database. Into, now we start from one, because zero has been reserved for the listening port. Right, so one, put it in there. And then for this particular new client, we also go into events, we also go to monitor it for reading, reading activity. And then continue. Right, so next time, we again, take out each socket ID from the client array and then check it. So check for this one, and then see whether that particular socket has
has some activity or not, whether it's reading or whether it's error. I have to check this or this. If there's activity, then read the value and then read the contents and then write the contents. Uh, where are we? Write the contents back to the client. In, in between, you check whether there's client try to close connection and so on, close socket ID, all these things. If you close socket, then we will again reset the value to negative one. Right. So, the, so the, the concept is, is the, the code is similar to the select. The only difference is that how you, how you assign the uh, how you assign the, va the values to the data structure which is used by pole now. Right. And uh, this is the, the client version. Right. Then uh, use a normal server, which is a forking server, which creates child process. And then by the server is by the client is using the select. Then is the second version which improves. Then we use the server using select. The client is a normal client which does not use select. Then you can try the same server using select with the client using select. All right. So now this is, uh, then you can use a pole version, server running pole, client is a normal client, or client running the select version. Right. Okay, so try that. <laughs>